Good morning. The song I had this morning, I was going through some songs a couple of weeks ago trying to get prepared for today, and I found this song, and at the time, Curtis didn't know where it came from, and I'd never heard it, so I listened to it, and I thought it, it really had a good message to it, so um, I'm going to sing this this morning. It's called The Prayer. us where we go and help us to be wise in times when we don't know let this be our prayer when we lose our way When shadows fill our day, lead us to a place, guide us with your grace to a place where we'll be safe. will be ended and every heart that's broken will be mended and we'll remember we are all God's children reaching out to touch you reaching to the sky we ask that life be Watch us from above. We hope each soul will find another soul to love. Just like every child who needs to find a place, guide us with your grace, give us faith so we'll be safe. Lead us to a place, guide us with your Give us faith so we'll be saved. Ooh. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, Judges chapter 7. 
is where we will be at Judges chapter 7 as the Lord leads us. Uh, this might be my last sermon series on Gideon. And so as we went through Judges uh, and talking about Gideon as the judge. And so Judges chapter 7 is where we will be at today. And after you have found that, if you would, stand out of reverence of God's word. Judges chapter 7. And we'll be starting in verse 9. And the Bible says, That same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. And you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. Verse 12. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance. And their camels were without number as the sand that is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. Verse 14. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. And as soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. And he divided the three hundred men into three companies and put trumpets into the hands of all the men and empty jars with torches inside the jars. Verse 17, And he said to them, Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle of watch, when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hands the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out a sword to look for the Lord and for Gideon. And every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. Verse 22 says, when they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beshetah toward Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Meloha by Tabath. Man, those were good words there at the end. Man, isn't that good? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. We praise you for who you are. And I ask, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, would you just continue, Lord, to bring us into you. Lord, we trust you this morning. I pray, Lord, would you help me as I preach your word? Would you hide me behind the cross so that only you are seen, only you are heard? Would you touch my mouth and my lips and my tongue? Lord, that only speak what comes directly from you. Lord, we want to give you praise in advance for what you're going to do for us. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus. And we all say together, amen, amen. You may be seated. This morning, I just want to preach a message the last one on Gideon here, which just titled, The Example Realized. See, a lot of times we see the example, a lot of times we may be the example, but there also will come a time when there's a realization to that example. And it will be put into place, into our lives and into the place of others. The example realized. Here in verse 9, we'll jump straight into it. And God begins to tell him, I have given them into your hands. See, once again, God reiterates what he's already said that he was going to do. 
Remember this, there's going to be times that Satan's going to try to come in and tell you that it can't happen. Satan's going to come in and try to make you nervous. Satan's going to try to come in and make you be fearful. But we have to go back and remember what God told us at the first. What God told Gideon to start with is this, I've given them into your hand. Now look what he does again. He reiterates that to Gideon because he wants him to understand, I'm still with you. I'm here for you. I will help and see you through this part. I'm sure maybe at this time we got to understand where Gideon is at as well. Looking down into the valley. <laughs> Looking down into the enemy. I, I wonder if Gideon was saying, yeah, right. <laughs> oh boy, we've come a long ways, Lord. You've done some pretty amazing things, but did you see all this? Do you realize what's going on right there? Go down to the camp. Are you kidding me? Hadn't I gone far enough? Listen, do you realize that in our lives, a lot of times we try to negotiate with God and we say, God, now I've trusted you up to this point. Do I really have to go any further? Can't you see that I've trusted you? And God says, just one more time. Just a little bit further. See, too many times we quit short of the victory. And we think victory is in our own minds. Victory is in how we feel. And God says, no, you stopped well short. Of the victory that I had in store for you. Imagine what it truly could have been. Sometimes like Gideon. We miss out that God is looking for obedience. God wants us to be an obedient people. Not just up to a certain point. But all the way through. God is looking at us and saying. How obedient will you be? Will you be as Jesus would say. Obedient even unto death. Oh, yeah, I'll do that up to a certain point. I'll get all the way close to it, but don't stop short. Don't sell God out. He wants you to go all the way. Obedience is what he asked for. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only. If all we say is, oh, yeah, I heard what he said, and we don't do what he said, then we've stopped short of the victory. We've stopped short of what he wants to do in our lives. 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel would say this, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Don't keep coming and saying, Oh, Lord, forgive me for it. No, 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 no. He says to obey is better than sacrifice. Don't ride the altar and say, I've got to ride the altar to heaven because I keep messing up. No, 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 no. Be obedient to the Lord. He gives you the strength to be able to live the way that he wants to obey God and his word. He wants to do some amazing things for you. He says, go down to the camp. Look at verses 11 and 12 with me, if you will. There was a reason that God truly wanted Gideon to go down to the camp. Understand this, a lot of times we can't receive the message that God wants to give us in the place that we're at. We want to say this, no Lord, I want to be comfortable and receive everything that you've given for me. And he says, no, no, it don't work that way. Because listen, God is not a God of comfort. We say, well, well, doesn't that go against scripture? No, 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 don't miss out. God is not a God of allowing you to sit on your couch and just cozy right in and think everything's great. That's not who God is. God is a God that says this, I will be with you, I will comfort you, but understand, I still need you to go all the way with me. I'll need you to go, it's going to be rough sometimes. He didn't tell the disciples, now this is going to be a cakewalk. He told the disciples, this is going to be tough. But he endures till the end, shall be saved. Don't cut, listen, don't cut the Lord short in what he wants to do. You see, God wanted Gideon to understand. Now listen, after you hear the message, it's going to be a little bit different. You see, what we want to do is we want to say this. We negotiate with the Lord. Lord, I'll stay right here. You tell me the message and then I'll do it. And God says, no, no. You be obedient, I'll give you the message, and then you'll understand. No, 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 Lord, I'm not doing that. You tell me the message. and I, Now listen, you know what God does? God says, fine, have it your way, but I ain't giving you the message. And most Christians go through their life stuck in the same old mess because we're not willing to be obedient to the Lord because we enjoy our mess more than we enjoy the benefit of serving the Lord. No, no, that couldn't be it. 
Well, why is it that most, most Christians are as miserable as can be? Because we try to negotiate with God, and God says, no, 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 I don't negotiate. You have to be obedient. So all of a sudden we see this in verse 11. He says this, Afterward, your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the gate. Listen, this is what he's saying. If you're obedient afterwards, this is what happens. You become strengthened after that part. After you do what I say. After you understand who I am and what I want from you. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 says this, But they were like locusts. They were like camels that you couldn't count because they were like numbers on the seashore. Can you imagine being up on the top? You ever been in that place? God says, now I need you to do this. And you say, okay, God has been faithful. He has been there for me. And all of a sudden you get there and God says, now look over into the valley. (laughs) You want me to do what? And God says, yeah. Yeah, I need you to go down there. (laughs) You must not be seeing what I'm saying. And God says, exactly. Oh, come on! Too many times we want to look with our physical eyes and say that's impossible. And God says, until you understand who I am and get my eyesight, everything's impossible. Yet with me, all things are possible. Until you get focused in on who I am and how I see, then everything you do, you will continue to say it's impossible. Can I tell you, the church is full of Christians that claim impossibility. Yet they claim to serve a God that does all things. Can I tell you, those two don't go hand in hand. So if you say God can't do it, then you've already counted out and and said that God is a liar. Oh boy, we don't want to go there, do we? Okay, going on to the next part here. He says, like locusts and camels without number. This is what Gideon begins to look at. Can you see Gideon right now? The closer that he gets, the more it becomes visible. Understand, God begins to speak to us. And he says, yeah, yeah, I know that, I know that, but I need you to keep going. And the closer that you get, it's coming. Well, you know what that is, don't you? Understand, that's not the Lord. Because the Lord does not give the spirit of fear. The problem is this. Satan knows that you're getting closer to the victory, and he's upset about that. (laughs) Satan wants you as far away from the victory as you can be. But I'll understand this. The reason why it is when you begin to do and be obedient to what God wants, the closer that you get to that, all of a sudden there's this lump in your throat. There's this part. Listen, you remember when the Lord saved you? You remember that night? You remember that day? You remember that morning? Remember that afternoon? Remember that car ride? Remember that church service? What it is? You know what happened right before that, moments before you gave in to that? You know what it was? You were holding on so tight that you had already gripped, and now you could go back and we could see your fingerprints put in the pew, right? Because you were holding on so tight, and all of a sudden your heart was going crazy. You know why that is? Because Satan was trying to say stay where you're at stay where you're at so you know why because he said you're too close to the victory I don't want you to be over there all of a sudden man Gideon gets up on here and he begins to look at this and I wonder if maybe Gideon was even in the same place and says this Lord if you're trying to strengthen me this ain't working too good right now I'm getting closer to the enemy and you're telling me this is good. Now watch. We say, no, that's contrary to everything. Now watch. Watch what God does. God says you got to understand who I am. I am your protector. If I'm telling you that you need to do something because of obedience, then understand, I'm the one who protects you. I need you to get down there because I've got something for you. So he begins to see this part of it. Understand this, that Gideon did not run from the enemy. Gideon did not run from the enemy. Once again, he was obedient. Understand, we have to listen to the Lord. It's a still small voice. Not the one that's screaming at you. That's the world. That's Satan. That's the enemy. He's the one trying to get your attention for everything else. God is saying this. No, no, no. No, no. Listen. Listen. Oh, yeah, right. I'm that voice. I'm that voice. That's the voice you want to hear. That's the voice that you want to understand. That's the voice. You You see, if we want to hear what God is saying, first you have to listen. You have to listen. See, here's it. You can't be too busy in your life, caught up in family, caught up in work, caught up in everything else, and then say that you heard the voice of God. Uh uh-uh. uh. Understand that sometimes family's got to be on the side, sometimes job's got to be on the side, sometimes all that, listen, sometimes church got to be on the side. I'm not talking about an attendance, I'm talking about too, being too busy in church. Because if you're too busy in church, you can miss God just as easy as you are out in the world. 
And so what has to happen is we still got to hear the still small voice. We got to hear what God is wanting to say to us. Look at verses 13 through 15 there. In verses 13 and 15, all of a sudden Gideon gets down to the camp. He was obedient. Gideon gets down to the camp and all of a sudden he begins to hear this story. He begins to hear a dream. And he's like, am I hearing that right? And here are these two people of the enemy. He begins to share a dream that he had. And his fellow partner over here, not realizing that Gideon and his servant were down there, begins to say, oh boy, we're in trouble. (laughs) Oh man, that's Gideon. That's Gideon. Now, can you imagine Gideon? Gideon's on the outskirt here listening. There's a reason God says, I need you down there. I don't believe that Gideon would have ever thought that good God would have worked it out in that way. You see, a lot of times we try to figure out how God's going to work in advance and not realizing this, we can't understand God. Because if you think that you've got God figured out, then you don't serve the God that I serve. Because understand, we will never figure God out in those things. Why? Because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. And so the thing that we have to realize is God does things the way God does things because he's God. Because we don't think the same as him because we're still in the physical. Even with the transforming of our mind, understand this, we will still never be God. We just need him to help transform the mind. He will always be God in what he does. I want you to truly notice here what Gideon did after he heard it in verse 15. He hears this story. He, the guy claims that it's Gideon. Gideon never expected to hear the message and the story that he heard right there. But look at verse 15. In verse 15 it says this. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. <laughs> he didn't wait till he got back home. He did it right there on the outskirts of the enemy. He worshiped because of what God had revealed to him in his life. He didn't wait and do it someplace else. He did it there because now it begins to all make sense about what God had told him in verse 11. In verse 11, God says this, if you go down, you'll be strengthened then. Gideon is obedient, not strengthened in the way that he thought that he would be strengthened, but yet when he gets to the enemy line, he hears something that God had already put in place. Then all of a sudden, Gideon gets strengthened because of what he's hearing, and Gideon says this, oh man, praise the Lord. He was strengthened so much that he praised the Lord right on the outskirts of the enemy that, listen, if, if he could hear them, they could hear him. Understand that. If Gideon could hear the interpretation of this dream with them talking, understand they could hear him. Oh, but we serve a God that protects us. There is something about being obedient that God blesses. And this is where we see him at right now. You see, there's been times that I haven't understood why or what God was wanting to do or why he was going to do what he did, but I trusted him. And when I did that, God told me, do you realize what I just did for you? I just strengthened you. Because you were obedient to go the place I asked you to go, that's where you become strengthened at. That's where all of a sudden you realize, man, I could have never done this before. Now realize this, you can't do what God asked you to do staying in the same spot your whole life. God always is drawing us closer to Him, and closer to Him is always going to be in obedience. God always speaks into our lives. If you claim the name of Christ, if you call yourself a Christian, you will never be able to stand still. You will always be getting closer to Him because that's what He does. He draws us into Him. He wants us closer and closer to Him as much as we can do. Psalm 68 verse 35 says this, Awesome is God from His sanctuary. The God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says this. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, how he strengthened Gideon. Look at verse 15. 
in verse 15, after he worshipped, it says, And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Now watch what he does. There is something about being obedient to the Lord that gives us the courage to go back and tell the people that we've been with that I may have not been strengthened before. It may have seemed like I was a little bit weak before, but the problem was that's true. I didn't really get strengthened until I got down here with the Lord. And man, he began to reveal some things to me. And the scripture says there at the end of verse 15 that he went back to the camp and he said, okay, uh, here we go. Come on. We went down from 32,000, now we're down to 300 men. And I know it seems crazy. It doesn't seem like it's going to work out. I know it seems like this is just a mad uh, a plan that we have. But understand, I've just heard what God wants to do for us. And this is what we need to do. He says, arise. There at the end of verse 15. For the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. Man, look at now the encouragement that has come to Gideon. Gideon is saying this, if I've ever believed that God was going to do it, I do it now. I really believe what he's going to do. I believe what he said he was going to do. I understand what he wants to do in our lives even at this very moment. Look at verses 16 through 22. 16 verse 22, through the whole thing here we have this whole story of now of how God is going to win the battle for Gideon. Now we look at this, you know what we say? Man, this is some kind of kid's made up story. That they would have jars and torches. And they could do that and it would cause that big of a stir. Well understand this. Unless you have childlike faith, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. So how much more could God do with a childlike plan? Sometimes we're like, well Lord, man that, that plan isn't, isn't as deep as what I thought it was going to be. And God says, no. It's not. Well, Lord, that, I mean, I thought there would be a lot more detail that would go into it that I would have. To, no, it's not. I just need you to be obedient. So if I need you to go over and grab hold of someone and pray for them on the street, that's all I need you to do. I don't Listen, I don't need you to go through the Roman road of salvation. I need you to be obedient. I don't need you to go out and try to preach a four-point sermon every time that you find someone. God says, I just need you to be obedient. You say, well, Lord, I just don't see how that's going to work out. I just don't see how I can witness to people in that way. And God says, no, 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 you just trust me. Because I'm already preparing the, the soil that you need to make sure that you do the job that I've asked you to do. And so maybe you're the one that's going to plant the seed. Maybe you're the one that's going to water. But I want you to understand God's got a plan that's in store that somebody's going to be in your path. And what you've got to do is just be obedient. Don't try to come up with your own plan. Too many people walk around and they're pulling out this thing and they flip it over and they're doing their own plan. And God says, would you throw that away? I've asked you to be obedient with doing what I need you to do. And here you come over. Can I tell you something? You can run people away from church and God faster than you can get them here when you start doing things that God don't want you to do. Listen to me. And that's including taking your Bible out and just all of a sudden start reading to people and doing all that. Because if God said, I don't need you to do that right now, guess what? They're gone. And you just wasted God's plan. But what we think is this, no, 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 I know best. I know best. It's got to be my way. And God says, fine, have it your way. But it ain't going to work. God says, I just need you to have childlike faith. Trust me when I ask you to do something and just do it. And so here we see this part of it. He begins to have it. We begin to look at verses 18 through 20. And Gideon begins to make sure people understand who's in control. And by the way, if you think that that's man, you think it's you, then you don't know who God is. Because it ain't me or you, either one that's in control. God's in control. He's the one that has the final say. He's the one that actually is the one that's saying, you know what, I've got this planned out. Come with me. Do this. It will work out. So look what Gideon does there in verse 18. And he gives them this whole plan. He tells them what to do. And he says, now this is what I need you to say. I need you to say this. For the Lord... Guess who's first? Don't ever put your name first. Don't put my name first. Don't put the church's name first. Too many people are so bragging about the church. Listen to me. Who cares about the church? It's just a building. We need to be concerned about the church. That's the real church. And so all of a sudden we look at this and he says, For Lord and for Gideon. 
Yeah, Gideon's name was in there, but understand, the Lord's first. Nothing happens without the Lord being first. Nothing will happen in your life without the Lord being first. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, he goes on down and he says, guess what? We're going to have something that's going to cause some damage. You're going to have something in your hand. And he says, a sword, now watch this, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Now understand, Gideon's in there, but Gideon's always second. If we would get to the point where we could understand that God's always first and we're always second, no matter what it is in life, everything would be great. In your home, Lord's always first, family's always second. In your home, when you get home, it don't all of a sudden reverse from what it does from church. When you get to your job, guess what? The Lord's always first, your job's always second. You say, well, my bosses have already told me this. Who cares what your boss says? Your boss ain't that boss. Your boss is the Lord. He's the one that's in charge. You say, well, I, I, I just don't know what to do because if I go against them, then I'm not going to have a job. Well, who do you trust more? Someone whiting your paycheck or someone that actually gives you the air you breathe? Man, when we really get down to it, we're like, you know what? Why am I always... Did you realize that more people are scared of their bosses and not realizing that, you know what, they're human just like we're human? That's the reason I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to talk to the DS, the GS. I'm not afraid to talk to any boss I've ever worked at. And you know why? Because they're just like me. Well, we say, well, they're the ones that do this. Well, they may be. But who do I trust more, God or them? When you stand up for what God says, because that's what being obedient truly is, is standing up for the word of God and not backing down from it, it's amazing what God does in your job. Well, if I lose that job, then I'm not going to have any place to live. Then you don't trust God. Because God says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, I'll take care of all the other things that I said in the preceding verses, which was your clothing, your food, and your shelter. But too many people are worried about, oh, I'm going to seek the Lord because that's what He's going to do is give me the food, clothing, and shelter first. No, 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 no. He'll give you righteousness first. Which means you're able to do the right thing. So really what it's time for, is time for Christians to quit being cowards and actually put God in a place that He needs to be. And I'll tell you this, if we would do that, the world would look a lot different. Because too many times we go to our jobs and then they're looking at us. You know what they say? They say, you're no different than what I am. And I don't go to church at all. You know why? Because we put all the things first that they put first. And then all we do is say that we love Jesus. And what they're saying is this. Man, if that's right, then I don't need anything. Because you do the same thing that I do. Oh boy, you say, where's all this going? Oh, it's going somewhere. We're getting there. We're getting there. And so all of a sudden we say, give credit where credit's due. God's always first, no matter what it is. It's never about us. Jesus would come on the scene, and that's what he would say. I didn't come here to be served. I come to serve. By the way, Jesus didn't do anything new. He did everything that God had already done. All he did was come in and say, hey, don't miss it. The reason that I'm here is for, to die for the sins of the world because God realizes that no longer are the bulls and the rams going to do any good. That has never sacrificed the wrath of an almighty God, but I'm getting ready to die that will sacrifice the wrath. And, and guess what? He'll be pleased with the offering that's getting ready to be. So then we see this thing. He didn't come in teaching new things. He came in teaching everything that God had always done. Why? Because they can't contradict themselves. Understand that. The New Testament, Old Testament do not contradict themselves. And so here we see this. This whole series that I truly have preached on, on Gideon, I, I want to make sure that you understand where we're at and what it, it, it truly means uh, about us all and about this Christian life. You see, this message that I preach today, and really like any other message that I preach throughout this whole thing, is talking about the example. The example. You do realize that you're examples. You're examples. <laughs> For young and old. I don't care how old you are and I don't care how young you are. You're still examples. And people look at you. And so whether you're 80 or whether you're 10 or whether you're 17 or whether you're 36, you're still examples. You're examples to young and old. People look at you. They want to see how you handle things. They want to see how you actually live your life. They want to know if you really got something different. If the words you speak are actually coming and actually living up to being doers of the word and not hearers only. 
And all of a sudden, the church begins to examine the church, which the church hates. Because how dare you look at me and do that? And yet, Paul says that I don't judge the world, but I do judge the church. And so what happens is this. If what you say is not living up to the word of God, then I'm going to hold you accountable, brother. You may not like it, but as I've always said, you'll get over it. <laughs> right? But we don't like that. Why? Because how dare you come in and tell me, you think you're holier than that? No, no, no. But I do think that God wants him to be first in all of our lives. Not just in one person's life. And all of a sudden we see this thing. The example is where we have to be. You see, there was a key verse in this whole story. There was a key verse in the whole thing that we read about Gideon. There's a key verse that will come into it. It shows us that Gideon finally understood what God was doing in his life. Have you ever seen people that, man, they were, they were, they were Christian. They'd been forgiven of their sins, that they're walking with him. But, man, there was a time when they really got it. See, there's a difference in getting saved and getting entirely sanctified and being filled with the Spirit. There's a difference in those two things. A lot of people want to try to say they're the same thing. Oh, but they're not. They're not. One is you've been forgiven of your past sins and you realize that you're a sinner because you were born into sin because of Adam and Eve. And now you have this original sin that's in you and you say, you know what, Lord, I need to be forgiven of that. I need you right now as my Savior to forgive me of all that mess. Praise the Lord, he forgives you. But understand, you're still sitting on the throne. You're still in charge. And God says, no, listen, it can't be that way. Because if you really want to be a follower of Christ, you've got to get off the throne and you've got to let me sit there. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit completely, it means you've got to die out to self completely. You've got to say that I'm done with all of that part. You see, from the time that the Lord called him out of the wine press and the uh, threshing wheat to tearing down his father's idols to building God's altars to taking the army of 32,000 down to 300 men, it came to pass in verse 17. In verse 17, Gideon finally understood what God was doing in his life. And in verse 17, look at what he says. He says this. He says, look at me and do likewise. We say, oh, I just don't know if I want people to look at me. Why? Why not? Are you ashamed of being a follower of Christ? Are you ashamed of the life you're living? Is it pathetic in Jesus' side? Because here's the thing. Paul says this, follow me as I follow Christ. So my question to you this morning is this. Have you been the example this week? Or have you been a stink in the nostrils of God? As the book of Genesis would say. Hmm. You're the example. I'm the example. But my question is this. What example have you been? Because realize you can be a bad example. And man, you can ruin your kid's life, your grandkid's life, your spouse's life, your family's life. You can ruin all that by being a bad example. And I'll just tell you. The church has always been full of bad examples that did it in the name of Christ. Lord, help us. Paul dealt with it a lot in the New Testament. Had to call them out. But I just wonder this morning. I just wonder. You see, it was more than just going into battle. It was more than just mimicking who, gimmick, uh, uh, who Gideon was and, and what he would do and how he would do the things. It was so much more than that. It really went back to look at me and do likewise. What Gideon was saying was this. I'll be the example because I know what God's done for me. I'll be the example. I'll lead you in the right way because I know how he's led me. I'm willing to be obedient to him. And so I, what I want you to do is I want you to be obedient to him. So follow me as I follow Christ. I'll be the example that you need. And Lord, what we do so many times is say, well, I just don't know if I can do that. Why not? Why not? With God, all things are possible. He can give me the strength of the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. Now listen, we make our own choices. So if we fall, it's not God's fault. It's our fault. Too many times we want to blame it on God and not really, listen, not really take God at his word. And we look at 1 John. And he says, I write this unto you that you sin not. 
that you sin not. Well, I just can't help but sin. According to what? According to what? Not according to God. God says it's possible. He can help you. He can do that for you. He can help you live a holy life. He can help you walk in a greater anointing. He can help you do all things. He can help you be that person. He can help you be the example. He can do it. See, the thing comes down to is, what more can God do than he's already done? Right? He's the great example. And we follow that example so that we can be the, you do understand that being Christ-like is being the example. Right? Being Christ-like is acting like Christ, which means we're the example to other people. Gideon was willing to be this for them. You see, really, when you think about it, now watch this. Gideon was trust, Gideon was faith, Gideon was obedience, Gideon was, Gideon was willingness, Gideon was living right, Gideon was lead, leadership. You know where all that came from? God. You know why? Because that's what God is. And so when we say, you know what, I want to live as God is. I want to be as Christ was. What we're saying is this. I want to do all the things that Christ did because Christ did them perfect. And I want that part of perfectness, listen, living in my life. But what we say is this. No, I can never do everything perfect. No, not in the sense of what you want to deem perfect. Because that word perfect is skewed in the world's eyes. Perfect in the eyes of the perfectness of God means doing exactly what you were created for. You do realize what you were created for, don't you? To be the example. To follow him and be the example. I just wonder. Jesus truly is our example. As they come on up and play this morning. Jesus is our example that to all who call themselves Christians. Listen to me. If you call yourself a Christian, a follower of Christ. By the way. Whew. If you die living the way that is contrary to the word of God and you know what you should have been doing, the scripture says it's been better if you'd never known. So this morning there ain't no one sitting under the sound of my voice that had not heard the right way to live. And so if you're not living right, you can't blame it on me. You can't blame it on somebody in the church. can't blame it on your family. Only one person to blame. And that person looks back at us every morning when we look in the mirror. And the first thing that we have to be real with and honest with, yes, is God, but also ourselves. Because we know ourselves just like God knows us. We know if we're where we need to be with the Lord. You see, for everyone who calls themselves Christians in turn in turn, is to be the example to someone else. There's no, you might be the example. It's a possibility, but you will be the example. It has to come out of you. It has to be there. So I would ask the question this morning, is can you turn to your left or your right? Could you really turn to your left or your right? I know it's probably somebody sitting beside of you that knows you real well, but the problem is this. We can even fool the people closest to us. And so I just wonder, could you turn to the left or the right this morning? Could you turn and do and say this, follow me as I follow Christ? Would they laugh at you because they know you better than that? Boy, that's sad. That's sad. Or would you be able to look at the person on your left or your right and you say, follow me as I follow Christ. And conviction would set in on them because they realize that's a true statement. <laughs> and I tell you what, the church needs more people to be convicted because of us walking into a room. Because they know that we're following the creator of the universe who died for our sins 
who rose again, who sent the Holy Spirit to fill our lives, to be able to be the example to each and every one we come in contact with. So I wonder this morning, can you be the example? Because the thing is this, if you call yourself a Christian, you have no other choice. Because calling yourself a Christian means you will be the example. And so this morning, as tough as the message that this may have been, as hard as this sermon series may have seemed, it does not change or negate anything that the Word of God says. If you claim Christianity, you must be the example. And so there's only one of two things that you can be this morning. You're either the example or you're a hypocrite. You have no other choice. It's one or the other. If you say that you're a follower of the Lord, and yet this week you've not been the example, you do understand, you know what that is? That's hypocritical. But I want you also to understand this. We serve a God that is a merciful and gracious God. And God just doesn't say, you got one chance, that's it, I'm done. Well, I'm thankful that he's not like that. Man, he's been good to me. So this morning, can I tell you how good God is? God is saying this. I need some examples. I need someone willing to stand up for me. I need someone willing that though it seems tough and it seems hard, I need someone to be obedient and go all the way. I need someone being willing to look at the left or the right, even when they don't ask for it, and says, I'll be the example. God is longing for people that will step up. God is tired of having to be in a spot to where it seems like he's having to pull teeth to get people to be his example. He wants people to be the example because they're so in love with him that nothing else can flow out except that. And so I just wonder... What about it this morning? Maybe this morning things happened. Can I ask you, were you the example? Before you ever walked out of your house. Before you ever got out of bed. Before you ever got to church. Were you the example? Understand this even more. That people watch you when you don't watch them. If I've ever understood anything, I realize that my children have eyes like hawks. They have ears that can hear if I was in a safe. <laughs> so the song that says, be careful little ears what you hear, be careful little mouth what you say, can I tell you it's true to adults. That me and my wife, you see me and my wife, we just don't come together and just say, hey, yeah, let's do this thing. It's a thing where we pray together each night. And we say, Lord, help us because we've got to be the example. Not just to you because we're the pastor's family. But because we've got three other eyes of children that are on us. That God gave to us and says, you be the example. And so he calls us out first to my family. You do realize that Gideon was the example to his family before he was to anybody else. Understand this. If you're not the example to your family, stop everything else that you're doing. Get your house in order. Because it don't matter if you save the rest of the world if you lose your family. Nothing else will matter.